So far, this video, this video series of key ships has touched on a German dictator and his pursuit of, well, a dream fleet and the polycratic, absolutely bureaucratic nightmare that he created in his entire armed forces which undermined their industry and infrastructure to the extent that, frankly, what they produced is actually surprising and it's almost hurtful to actually have to see the poor ship and the options it could have been and how it got desecrated. We have talked about a Soviet dictator and how a ship class named for his city, which is immortalized in a movie, its resistance during World War II, or as the Russians would call it, the Great Patriotic War, and the impact that could have had on the wider world. And now we have another interesting individual, and I will start off by saying I am not doing this video talking about his wider politics, because frankly, a lot of them are obnoxious and abhorrent to us today, and wouldn't really fly with many people in the UK. Um, at the time he was a senator. They didn't really fly with many people in America either. Not as much as sometimes it's perceived they did. There are also a few other issues with him. But leaving that to one side, he has a policy on warships which is interesting, because, you see, he comes at it from two directions. When he st joins the Naval Committee, and he's looking at these things, he's, he's trying to ask the US Navy, how big can a battleship be built? Because he's fed up with them keep coming back with the new ships are just a bit bigger each year. He wants to know the maximum battleship they could build. That's where they get their other name, the maximum battleships. He wants to know how big they could be built. Because, frankly, he thinks they should just skip the middlemen and just build those. And you can understand that to an extent. I have often said he's anti-naval spending. He's anti-wasteful naval spending. And his view is it's pointless to spend this money on these ships when they're going to be surpassed in five minutes. He actually wants naval spending. He goes to a lot of effort to get naval spending spent in South Carolina. A huge amount of effort to get naval spending in naval, uh, South Carolina. And he's very successful in that. Let's be honest, the Senate's, uh, the committees in the Senate to do with armed forces have ever been a mixture of those who are out for patriotic duty and those who are out for I would love to say out for their states but really let's be honest if you're bringing that many defense contracts etc to your state and to your your area you represent you are trying to get re-elected by being able to shout about the jobs and to make sure you get nice donations to fund your campaigns. Who knows? Perhaps it's a com uh, Perhaps it's your patriot, and it's a it's just a happy accident. All the uh, all the contracts are going to your state. Just a happy accident. But um, yeah, I'll, I'll. Sorry, the historian in me doesn't really believe that. And let's be honest. I specialise if you in terms of publication I focus in on the Royal Navy. That's the easiest one for me to get access to the archives of. It's one of the joys of being a historian. If you do move abroad and 
you have to ch or to some extent you have to change archives because you either have to depend on making annual or semi-annual visits to the archives you used to you, you grew up with you know and you learned on you have to learn the archives you will now have access to on a local basis it's always fun but the thing is I can point to the town class cruisers I can point to the Royal Navy's capital ship programs and I will call it the capital ship programs because it encompasses battleships and battle cruisers in the run up to World War One and their cruiser programs and I can also point out how those the yards chosen happen to map out to certain MPs constituencies and certain key areas for the government which are economically not as successful as other areas. Honestly, I think that's one of the things which does for the London Steel, uh, the, uh, the London Thames, you know, ironworks, the, uh, the, the big ship, uh, ship manufacturing company on the Thames, because there's lots of employment around the Thames. There's lots of work around there. Yeah, if it goes belly up, that's annoying, and that's a la yard lost, but let's be honest, those people will find jobs, and no important MPs are going to lose their seat over it. Yes, I'm treating myself to an iron brew. I don't usually have extra ones during the week, but this is late, and I'm treating myself. So, there are reasons going on here. There are factors going on here affecting the construction program. But, saying that, the Tillman class do need to be thought about because there is a scenario where they get built or something equivalent to them gets built. One of the interesting things about Tillman is As much as we might derail him and, you know, go, oh, good lord, Tillman. There is a factor that, you know, some of his des some designs he pushes forward and pushes through, they cause actual good thinking to come from them. There's, of course, terrible thing to come from them. At one point, the Bureau of Construction basically takes the design and goes, well, it can only fit in two dry docks in the country. So instead of thinking... Well, that means we probably need to expand the dry docks. No, what we'll do is we'll, we'll take 3,000 tonnes off it and we'll reduce its speed down to 20 knots. It, it kind of helps us look at the actual thinking going on in the US Navy and the government and the Bureau supporting at the time and actually tell us how navally minded they are. Because you can argue, yeah, it makes more sense to have more yards which can t do the uh, which can do the infrastructure, but the question should surely be: Let's build more. Hang on. Now, I knew it was wrong. I, for some reason, I hadn't that page hadn't refreshed. Anyway, he entered the Senate in 1895. And he entered it, entered it opposed to naval construction, opposed to naval rearmament, because he feared the president would be having to sell bonds, which would only enrich the rich and would devalue the country and would cause all sorts of economic problems. Very quickly, he learns that um, there are all sorts of things that can happen. And from 1901... Charleston Naval Yard start, uh, Charleston starts to get a lot of work and in 1909 it, get re it gets recognised as a proper Naval Yard and by 1913 he is the chairman he is the chairman and let's think about this because he is a Democrat he's a member of the Democratic Party and he's the chairman. For most of his period, 
It has been Republicans in charge. He has been one of the Senate minority members. So in 1890, from 1895, there was James Donald Cameron as chairman of the committee. And then it was Eugene Hale. And then it's George C. Perkins. But in 1913, Tillman gets to take charge. And he stays as chairman of that committee till 1918. Pretty much the entirety of the U.S. Navy that's built in those five years, or started in those five years, is in some way down to him or his involvement. And he is obsessed with big battleships by this point. Now, you could argue that's because big battleships equal big contracts and big dividends. But, you know, big battleships. He wants them big and he wants them fast. Honestly, he'd have loved the Iowas. Absolutely loved them. Um, on, uh, you know, he is unquestionably a proponent, although I won't say quite what motivates him, but I have my strong suspicions, considering how quickly he does an about-face from being rabidly anti-naval expansion to pro-naval expansion as long as it's built in South Carolina. Um, he is unquestionably a proponent of the largest, most powerful U.S. Navy you can get. And I would argue for the US Navy it's to an extent for all the all the problems he creates and all the fa the fact he sort of he dies in 1918 lose the loss of his voice the US Navy loses a very strong ally for a larger navy. He might be an annoying ally who constantly questions their construction decisions and their selection and their type of battleships they want to build. He might be the kind of ally who goes, what? Is that as big as you can do? Or, excuse me, your, 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 your priority is not to build the best battleship we can build, but our dry docks are too small, so you want to be able to fit them in, more of them? Then build bigger dry docks! Here! Money! Build them in South Carolina! Um, I have a few other senators on this committee. We'd all like a dry dock. You're from Utah? That could be a hard one, but well, uh, well, give me a chance and we can build a dry dock there. I'm sure there's some way we can do it. Um, this is... What's going on? And then let's look at the ships he's planning on building. These ships are intriguing. Okay? They have capabilities. They really do. This is design one. I think, yes. Seventy thousand tons. Twelve sixty inch guns, eighteen inches of armor. To say that the design studies have an impact on some of the stuff the US Navy's working on. Is to underestimate it. He starts off in 1912 with this work. He starts off in 1912 talking about this. And the phrasing of his request. He wanted to know what was the biggest battleship they could actually make use of, given the limitations of the existing docking facilities and the Panama Canal. 
And you might say, well, hang on. That surely means the dry do the, 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 that they're right when they cut them short for the dry docks. No. Because the first version, which was the enlarged Nevada of 38,000 tons and 12 14 inch guns, a 17 inch belt of 23 knots, it could only fit in two dry docks. And this is where they upset him because they were both, those dry docks were on the west coast. Now, you're probably thinking, hang on, but South Carolina, that's East Coast. Surely, he won't accept, a, he won't mind them deciding that they have to, you know, save 3,000 tons and cut the... No, no, no. Remember, this is a man who seriously, for whatever reason, does consider infrastructure spending to be an absolutely excellent idea. You, you cut it down, you cut its speed down, you cut everything else down, so that you could put it into all the docks without investing in them? Can you imagine his reaction? There was a level of exasperation going on. Now, he then argues that battleships have to make at least 25 knots. And there is an actual argument in a committee about this. He's going, they have to make at least 25 knots. Interesting enough, he's arguing this at a time when the Queen Elizabeth class are being projected and talked about and are being constructed. And of course, their aiming speed is 25 knots. They originally were, eight, uh, were hoped to make 28 knots, and that is certainly what Jellicoe would have liked them to make. But 25 knots is what they've accepted. And he's now saying, well, no, our battleships have to do at least 25 knots. Well, the Bureau of Construction and Repair do not like this. The Bureau of Construction and Repair don't. And they point out that to get 25 knots, you have to sacrifice four guns and substantial protection and it becomes a battle cruiser instead of a battleship. At this point, you also have Joseph Daniels involved, and he's the current Secretary of the Navy, and he is determined to hold down battleship growth. That's not just my words. That I have to admit, many, many sources have used, and there is actually a speech attributed to him saying that he will hold down battleship growth because battleships do not need to grow. Obviously, he's not taking notice of any other ships around at the time. At all, you know. He's not looking at what's being built. He is trying to keep his head firmly in the sand. Honestly, Joseph Daniels is probably a good example of a Secretary of Navy. You almost want to spin them around, apart from the politics. Uh, there again, neither are particularly nice from a political perspective. So, yeah, you, you, you don't... You, you, you probably want to... You, from a naval perspective, spinning them around probably good, because you have one who's actually going to push for a bigger, more powerful Navy... And one who feels that his job is to constantly hold it in line. One should be the chairman of the committee, the naval committee, the guy who's holding it and wanting to hold it to account and hold it in line. And the other one should be the secretary of the navy. They're in the wrong post. Um, whatever their motivations for it. Then he becomes chairman of the Naval Affairs Committee. He becomes chairman of it. He best abide his time a little while while he's settling into post and getting things and he then asks for another investigation. He pushes forward. And that's where you get a lot of these designs come in. All these designs in a rush. These ones are him in power. His first look had been 1912. This 1916. It it took him a few years. And it's the cycle of the Senate. Now the limits he imposed this time were just the uh, on length and beam 
was the Panama Canal, as it existed at the time, and draft was limited by harbours to around 34 feet. So that's what you see here. The length of the canal dock maximum can take is 97 feet length and 108 feet beam. And this is not my work. I found this on the internet with no attribution. It was just going or floating around. So whoever does put this together, really, really good job really really nice table um, I have to admit I usually use the Wikipedia page to get pictures because my view is if the pictures are on Wikipedia I know it's fine to use sadly enough sadly enough the Wikipedia page has been blocked the maximum battleships page has been blocked the entire time I've been doing research for this video and so I have found pictures and tables through Google searches and more things have popped up. And where I have found a link, I would like to point it out to them. I would say navelgazing.net, maximum battleship. I'm fairly sure these pictures come from you. Because the pictures just showed up at various points in various chats unattributed, it, and including on Discord. And when I ended up finding your article I went oh those pictures do look similar they don't look exactly the same but they do look similar they do look similar but what you see here is a constant theme of him working on something this is a 30 knot vessel 60 odd thousand 63,000 tons 12 16 inch guns, 50 caliber guns in four triple turrets. That's not something to laugh about. That's a fairly decent sounding, reasonable sounding vessel. And a 30 knot speed. Could be useful. He's got 18 inch guns. Honestly, the Tillman 3 is not that far off of Montana. It's actually supposed to be a little bit faster. Which you can explain by it being a little bit longer, uh, a, narrow, a little bit a narrower beam, you know, length to beam does tend to have an effect on things, and a little bit shallower draft. And the South Dakotas, the planned South Dakotas, if you look at them, you're going, yeah. We see what they lost when they lost Tillman. You lose Tillman, you lose three knots of speed. At the least. Because if these are being built, and if you look at this, this does look not that far off in some regards to a Tillman free in some of its formations. He was pushing for it to be 30 knots. Tillman himself dies on the 3rd of July 1918. The South Dakota class, if I just check, of 1920. The design was, broadly speaking, settled on and started to be firmed up not that long after he died.
Not that long at all. In fact, if I add this in, I went to my image sections. I always got one somewhere. Please don't appear in the wrong place. Yeah, it appeared not as wrong as it has appeared in the past. It looks a fairly decent design, doesn't it? It look the South Dakotas are one of my favourite classes, and they could well appear in another video because I think they, along with the loss of the G threes and the N threes, are the lost gener are some of the lost generation of the post World War One designs. Well, it's interesting to think about what a South Dakota in a Tillman present world, where Tillman is still around, pushing them, is going, uh, would be. This is the Tillman 4. And the Tillman 4... Wow. That's 24 16-inch guns. In, with 18 inches of armor. Four sextuple turrets. Let's be honest, that's going to be cramped as anything. Uh, I, I'm not sure who produced that one. But it's after the Tillman 4 that the US Navy and the Bureau of Ordnance starts going, well, why don't you look at 18-inch guns? Why don't you... Please, look at 18-inch guns. Please. Look at... Stop looking at 16-inch guns. There's only so many we can fit all those, and we can build all those. But again, the emphasis keeps going on on speed, firepower, armor. Tillman, whether he thinks it or realizes it or not, is pushing for the creation of the fast battleship. Yeah. He's the butt of many naval historians' jokes, including my own. Because, frankly, some of the requests he does make to the Navy and some of the ideas he pushes forward and some of the stuff which comes up, including this thing, are absolutely absurd. Because, let's be honest, and let's hide this away and I'm probably going to need to hide this away for this as well the rule of thumb is if you've got one gun in a turret that's this many problems X two twin turret two X okay all right three four X four Well, you're at 8x. And that is how it keeps going up. So, 5 is going to be 16x. 6, 32x. In other words, there is absolutely... No likelihood at any point of all six guns working in a turret, and probably that turret isn't going to work at all. But the point is, Tillman's asking the designers who should know better to come with these designs and to work it out and try and fit in the maximum they can into that space of the Panama Canal. But the thing is, he is not the subject matter expert. He's asking people. He's asking them. This is the final of the battleships. It's the final one. It's the one with the 
18, uh, the, f I think it's 15, 18 inch guns. Yes, 15, 18 inch guns. 80,000 tons, 16 inches of armor. This is a vessel designed to give everyone a nightmare. And if we go back to here, well, 25.2 knots. Let's be honest, if you've got 15, 18 inch guns and you can do 25 knots, no one is going to want to get into range of you. They might be able to be fast and you, they might be, but no one's going to want to get into range of you because that's just not nice. Not nice at all. And I was going to do the summary here. But I felt that was a little unfair. So I'm going to bring back this. And I'm also going to bring up another one. Which should, he says, if it were, uh, should work. Which I didn't include in the original lineup because, frankly, I felt it was, in a way, a bit pandering to do so. And that is the Tillman Free. Or what I would call the Tillman South Dakota versus the South Dakota. Think about it. The South Dakota class, as ordered by the US Navy, has 12 16 inch guns. So does the Tillman Free. The difference is the Tillman Free can do 30 knots. Go back here. And we get up. Sorry. The slideshow. And I go through till I find the Tillman Free. You can see number three, 30 knots. Make it all nice and neat. Sorry. 30 knots. A South Dakota that can do 30 knots. Think about it if the US Navy had listened to him when building the Colorados. The Colorados have eight 16 inch guns. They can do 21 knots. There is not a ship here which can do less than 25 knots. Would the US Navy have rated Hood as highly as they rated her? If, if the Colorados could do 25 knots? Would the Royal Navy have bothered to complete Hood if the Colorados could do 25 knots? Probably. Tillman is not a visionary, and his battleships are not visionary. That are name frame. They are sure. They're also called the Maxim battleships and various other things. They're not vision. They're not visionary, but they are whatever it's motivated by. Perhaps an unfettered look into what should have been being looked at by the U.S. Navy. Because if this is what it's possible to build, and I would argue strongly about some of them not being actually possible, but some of them are certainly not impossible. The Tillman Free is not impossible. And if the Tillman had been this, uh, Tillman sort of had been able to actually push through these vessels. If he'd been able to get them built 
as he wanted them to be built. The world would have been very different. In a way, Tillman, however he comes about it, actually understands that the race with Britain, the race in the world at this point, is a technical race. It's a qualitative, not quantitative race. It's the status of the biggest and the best which matters, not how many of them you have. And look, asking what's the biggest ship you can justify building and using. And then railing when someone turns up and they've cut it down in size and everything because it didn't fit in enough dry docks. Because it's no longer, it's t and they were only designing it for 23 knots in the first place. For whatever reason... He does that. For whatever inspires him to do that. Doesn't mean he's wrong. Doesn't mean he's wrong. What he's pushing for, what this, all these work, this work is about, is not wrong. Its motivations might be. It, you could be incredibly cynical about it. But pushing for fast, well armored, well uh, with decent firepower. So well-armed battleships is not a bad thing. And this series, this key ship series, is about ships that could have been and the impact they could have had. Well, the Colorados are laid down in 1919. And they are launched and commissioned by 1922. Before them comes the Tennessee class. Armed with 12 14 inch guns. Top speed 21 knots. And they are laid down in 1917 and October 1916. Launched 1919 and commissioned 1920 and 1921. Imagine if in 1916 the US Navy had turned around to Senator Tillman and gone, we're going to take this design, the Tillman Free, and we're going to run with it. It might not have turned out at 30 knots. It might have only turned out 28 knots. Could it have had, still had the 12, 16 inch guns? Who knows? They've got triple turrets working at five. And the next generation, next class of ship has the 16 inch guns. So, yeah, potentially. Think about what would have happened in the world if the US Navy finishes World War Two, World War One, with six vessels in various stages of completion, which all have twelve sixteen inch guns and all have a speed of thirty knots or aim for speed of thirty twenty or thirty knots. Think about the impact on the world at that point.
Think about the world of having six 60,000 ton fast battleships coming into service. They can all fit through the Panama Canal. It's an interesting thing to think about. And as a theme it is with the key ship series, that's the question today. That's what I'd like you to think about. Tillman somehow gets his most reasonable design, number three, to actually be built. It forms the basis of the Tennessee standards forward, so the Tennessees and South Dakotas. So that means the New Mexico's are the last of the 14 inch ships. Right then, this will come out on the 2nd of June. And hopefully, when I'm recording this, he says, hopefully we have raised the money. And hopefully I am on my way to Australia. I don't know if I will be at this point. It's the 26th of April. We have a big fundraising weekend coming up. We are going to be really pushing things and hopefully we'll raise the money necessary. And hopefully, as this video comes out, I will already be in the air flying away because I have to get there before my colleagues to set stuff up and make sure everything works. Thank you. None of this would be possible without your support. None of this would work without you. So thank you. And hope you enjoyed the video.